Good afternoon. Welcome to Monday, June 14. It's our class session, Math 264, Introduction to Ordinary Differential Equations at Delta College. And we have a very interesting class for you today. Today we get to finish chapter three, which means we completely classify all two-dimensional first-order linear systems. And as a consequence, that means we completely classify all damped harmonic oscillators. Homogeneous damped harmonic oscillators. We will deal with forced or non-homogeneous damped harmonic oscillators in chapter four. Okay, other highlights of this week. Recall that you have an exam coming up on this weekend. Exam two is gonna be released by 11.59 p.m. on Thursday, June 17. It's gonna be due similarly by 11.59 p.m. on Monday, June 21. Uh, it should look very similar to exam one in format. So now what we're trying to do is since we're getting into a rhythm is just to polish off this course at top speed, top speed, by mean I'm, by that I mean efficiency. We're actually covering material slightly slower as we go along because we're getting the big, big material now. It's like a hundred yard dash. You start off out of the box relatively slow, get up to top speed, and you go through the tape. So you know how the homework system works. You know how the exam system works. You know how papers are graded and returned to you. You know what your grade report looks like. You know how you're trying to max out the homework points now. And, and when I'm making these statements, if I'm making an incorrect assumption, you can check it with me privately in the chat or by email or just pop up a question. But you've got the structure, the pace, the system down. And now we're delivering with all those distractions out of the way, we're delivering the big, big material. So chapter three is a major accomplishment. And then the rest of this week is devoted to chapter five. Now you say, why should I go from chapter three to chapter five and skip over chapter four? I will explain why we're choosing that order next time, tomorrow. But right now, what we're doing is hitting the major sections. We're not going to do everything in chapter five. And, and you're probably used to the concept that you cannot do everything in every book. So we got to hit the major points. And chapter five is a beautiful chapter. It justifies fully what we're doing here in chapter three. But we don't have time to completely do it. So I'm going to hit two highlights in chapter five and then go back to the mainstream, what we need to know, chapter four and chapter six. Okay, so what is the trace determinant plane? How does this allow us to classify all two dimensional first order linear systems? So I am going to turn my computer around. You can still catch me in the chat. Let's go over to the whiteboard and let's work on some examples. Now the reason I'm doing this, particularly on the whiteboard, is because, I mean, it's, it's nice to write on paper, but there's a reason people make presentations on chalkboards, on whiteboards, it used to be chalkboards, whiteboards, PowerPoints, whatever, PowerPoint, I don't favor. And it's because you want to be able to just jot notes and quickly erase things. So I'm gonna to switch to the board now. Gonna get hand in there, very good. Replace pin, there we go. Let's look at the trace determinant plane. And let's do several quick examples and help you make the big, big speech. Now, when we go back to the paper, I'm going to look at two particular handouts. I've already previewed these handouts with you. And that was the description of the trace determinant plane 
by this tree and by this image. And so we're gonna fill in this image today, not in the beautiful detail that I wrote it here, but generally on the board. And then we might knock out one or two examples from this handout of practice differential systems. So that's the plan. What is the trace determinant plane and why is it so powerful? Well, let's review first order linear system, two dimensional. It's determined by this matrix, A, B, C, D. And the matrix has some key properties. It's trace and it's determinant. This is the notation of this book. The trace is the sum of the elements on the main diagonal. The determinant is the product of the main diagonal minus the product of the off diagonal. So AD minus BC. We're talking about two by two matrix. You can have trace and determinant for any square matrix. And the things that I'm telling you are true for square matrices in general, but we're only talking about two dimensional square matrices today and in this chapter. So that simplifies our calculations quite a bit. So we know that with a trace and determinant, we form the characteristic equation. Make sure you write minus trace lambda plus determinant. And this minus is a product of linear algebra. And maybe I'll show you where that minus comes from. I don't know if it's today, but I'll show you why it's logical. I mean, it looks out of place in a sense the first time you see it, but it's actually completely logical that you write the characteristic equation that way. Now, regardless of the nature of the roots, and I haven't emphasized the quadratic formula yet when we're doing this, is this is ordinary quadratic equation. We factor it when we can, but we always have the quadratic formula. So what's the quadratic formula? The opposite of b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac. Now here, the opposite of b is t, b squared is t squared. Well, it's minus t squared, which is t squared. And then minus 4ac is minus 4 times 1 times d. And this t squared minus 4d was important to you even on the first day you learned quadratic equation. Divided by 2a, everyone divided by 2a, a is 1. So this tells us whether or not these roots are real or complex or repeated, right? Think about this. And those were the border cases that we started to discuss last time. If t squared minus 4d is 0, then I'm just taking t over 2 plus or minus 0 over 2. So then lambda 1, lambda 2 will just be t over 2, t over 2. Repeated real roots. If t squared minus 4d is positive, make sure I got everybody in the room here. Okay, I'm not missing anything, good. If t squared minus 4d is positive, then this root is a positive number and the plus or minus will get different roots of t plus quantity, t minus real quantity over two. So those will be two real roots. It could be both positive, both negative, or one positive, one negative. If t squared minus 4d is a negative number, though, this is a complex number. And this gives me two complex roots, complex conjugate roots. And we know how to deal with those to construct our solutions. That introduces decay or growth and the oscillation from the complex real, the imaginary part of the complex number here. So let's show you how powerful this is. Let's just take a matrix at random. So how about one, two, three, seven. One, two, minus three, seven. Let's say that's your matrix in the system. You want to solve this completely. You want to know what it is before you solve it. So here's what you do. You take out the trace, eight. You take out the determinant, seven. 
minus negative six is 13. And one more time, one more key fact, let's look at trace squared minus determinant, or let's look at the competition between trace squared and 4D. Let's determine the nature of these roots. Notice trace squared is 64, 4D is 52, excuse me, And so trace squared is bigger than 4D. Now, I'm going to say it this way casually in English while we're talking today. Trace squared wins. In other words, trace squared is bigger than 4D. Trace squared defeats 4D. So if trace squared wins, if trace squared is bigger, what do I have here? I have two real roots. Now let's look over here in this plane, not the xy plane, not the ab plane, that's later, but let's write horizontal axis as the trace axis and vertical axis as the d-axis. And let's locate this point. Let's locate this matrix. I am not trying to draw to scale. So right now you might think like, eight and 13, well, that's got to be way up here. But this is not drawn to scale. This is just a generic parabola. The point of interest is what? When trace squared minus 4D equals zero, that's when trace squared equals 4D. But I'm not on that parabola. So either I'm above it or I'm below it. Uh, be careful how you read this. Am I above or below the parabola? Well, look at D as the vertical axis, right? So if D is the vertical axis and you solve this for D, what you're saying is D is equal to one quarter T squared. So D is less than T squared over four. In this case, D is less than t squared over four. That means I'm actually over here. Now get proportion out of your mind. Excuse me. I'm at the trace of determinant equals eight over 13. This is not proportional, 8 to 13. This is just a diagram. I mean, I could choose the scale to make it proportional if I wanted to, right? I got to look back at my computer here once in a while just to make sure I haven't missed anybody coming into the class. So what do I have right here? Positive trace positive determinant. I'm in the first quadrant. Remember, we've already said, if this is a negative number, if determinant is negative, then one of these people is negative and neither one can be zero. That would be called a saddle. But I'm squarely in the first quadrant and below this parabola. I don't know what the roots are. I don't want to work out the roots, but I have t squared minus 4d is positive number. And it's less than t, by the way. Do you see that? When you take t squared and you detract from t squared, then this quantity, when you take the square root, is less than t. So I'm taking t plus or minus something less than t. That means both those numbers up there be positive. Both of these are positive, and they're both greater than or equal to zero, and they're both real, right? Since this determinant is positive, and the sum of the two is positive, never forget, 
The trace is the sum of the eigenvalues and the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. So now I know I have two positive eigenvalues. Why not two negative eigenvalues? Because two negative eigenvalues could produce 13 when you multiply them. Yeah, but two negative eigenvalues would not produce eight. So what do I got right here? I have a source. This land is source land. Here's the parabola t squared equals 4d. This region right here must be the region where t squared wins. This region is where t squared wins. So if you look at a matrix and you've got positive trace, positive determinant, t squared wins, you just say source. From now on, you just say source. This region is when the determinant is negative. And it doesn't matter whether trace is positive or trace is negative. If the determinant is negative, this thing is a saddle. Because the only way for the determinant to be negative is if I have one positive and one negative eigenvalue. You say, what if these are complex numbers? Couldn't that make the determinant negative? Actually not, because if these are complex numbers, they occur as a conjugate. And the product of those two conjugates will be positive or at worst zero, but almost always positive. Okay, so now we're filling this in. Now remember, we have 13 cases. But this is why we went over here today. So let's just take another one at random. Well, kind of marginally at random, right? Because I must have some method to this madness. So let's take some other numbers. If we were in the classroom, sometimes I would say, oh, shout out some numbers to me. Well, let's try this matrix. Minus three, four, minus one, one. Let's locate it. Trace equals minus two. Determinant equals what? Negative three minus negative four. Negative three plus four is one. Okay, who wins? Trace squared or four D? I just usually write them next to this by the zone. Trace squared is four. 4D is four. Ooh, it's a tie. Where am I? Now let's look at the quadrant. Trace is negative, so I'm in the second quadrant. Determinant is positive, so that puts me in the second quadrant. But T squared is equal to 4D. I'm not even sure I intended that. That puts me on this parabola. Let's mark that point. Uh, maybe I'll stick with black here. And again, remember, I'm not doing anything to scale. So that eight and 13, I'm about to erase anyway. Let's put minus two, one about right there. And I'm gonna erase this soon too. So what do we have right here? We have, if we worked out the eigenvalues, and since t squared and 4d are the same, this is just a big zero. So what are my eigenvalues, one and two? Well, they're both t over two. And that's an easy number to calculate. It's minus one. So now I'm on the border case. I'm on one of my border cases. And remember how we constructed the eigenvalue and almost eigenvalue for this? So I would say subtract minus one from the main diagonal. This will give me minus two, four, minus one, two. I'm writing two small here. And this gives me an eigenvector of, you can reverse these numbers, change one sign. I'll take two and one. 
And then I need to repeat that for the generalized eigenvector, four minus one, two. What vector should I put in there? You get two and one. And that vector is, again, you got freedom to choose right here, but you can choose many things. I'll choose zero and one half. So now I know what this system is. This is the almost spiral sink. It's a sink because the trace is minus two. And what does that give me for my solutions? It gives me a negative exponential on my general solution, right? Two, one, be the minus one T eigenvalue T plus T two, one. And the almost eigenvector, the generalized eigenvector, zero, one half. The minus two. It's definitely decay. Everything is decay, but there's only one straight line solution. This is the almost eigenvector. This is the almost spiral sink. So what I have here, I want to write on these borders. I want to remind you of the drawing that I made more carefully but I'm going to write this as an abbreviation, almost spiral sink. And I refer again to this more careful drawing if you wanna see it more artfully presented. Well, you know, I didn't intend to land on that problem, but I picked four numbers and I landed on the parabola. So how about picking some numbers that get me off that parabola? Now let's think about how to get off the parabola. How do you get off the parabola? Well, the parabola is very thin. It's like walking on a tight wire. It's like walking on a high wire. If I just jiggled this matrix a little bit, I'd probably fall off that wire. Let's try it. How do you want to jiggle that matrix? Let's make this uh, a two. And let's repeat our calculations. Don't just change that one to a two. And this is why I wanted to go to the whiteboard so I could just erase, make examples, erase, make examples. Okay, let's erase. You know, and I also sincerely hope that this does what I want it to do, right? So let's write down trace. Let's write down determinant. Let's look at t squared 4d, see who wins. So trace right here is minus one. <coughs> Excuse me. Determinant is negative six plus four, negative six minus negative four. You know, I jiggled that too hard. What's negative six minus negative four? Negative six plus four is negative two. Do you know what? I don't even care about this anymore. The moment I come up with negative, this is a saddle. So let's place this matrix on the board. A trace of negative one, dropping down two. I didn't do the exciting thing I wanted to do. I just gave you an ordinary saddle. Okay, back to two and one. 
Maybe there's some other way I could adjust this. So let's put the two right here. So let's jiggle that number. Let's shake that number a little bit. These were relatively close. I was trying to be closer. Erase, erase. What's the trace? Minus two. What's the determinant? Negative three plus eight. Just be really careful you don't screw up any signs. Negative three plus eight is five. Now trace squared is what? Four. And 4D is what? 20. Oh, 4D wins. That's the way I want to say it, or at least that's the way I generally say it to myself. 4D wins. What does it mean when 4D wins? 4D wins means this is negative number. It means this is oscillation. Oscillation means sines and cosines. And the negative trace means what? I'm on the left-hand side. I'm above the horizontal axis. I'm in the second quadrant. And since D is bigger than one fourth T squared, all right? If four D is bigger than T squared, then D is bigger than one fourth T squared. Where am I? I'm above the parabola. I'm in this region here. T squared is a loser. Let's kind of generally locate minus two and five. Well, this was minus two and one. Remember, I am not drawing anything to scale. Minus two and five must be, you know, just above it. But what do I have? I have a spiral sink, decay, sinking action, but oscillation, oscillation and decay, spiral sink. I will abbreviate spiral sink. Okay, good. Now this is enough to fill in a lot more of this table, right? If above the parabola with negative trace is spiral sink, then above the parabola with positive trace must be spiral source. So here, let's say T squared again is a loser. T squared loses. This must be spiral source land, spiral source land in here. Anytime you see positive trace, positive determinant, and T squared loses, you have a spiral source. Anytime you see positive trace, positive determinant, and T squared wins, you have a source. When you see positive determinant, negative trace, you can move your arms like this if you want to, because you're taking the test at home anyway, and you're facing your paper like I'm facing the board. Okay, positive determinant, negative trace, T squared loses, spiral sink. And that must mean by symmetry, when T squared wins, this must be a traditional sink. Remember, this parabola is a border. It's when T squared equals 4D. Now, this is gonna be a very littered drawing. It's gonna be a very cluttered drawing, right? So I'm gonna erase some of these dots. In the end, I'm gonna refer you to the paper where I drew it very, very neatly with icons that remind you of the systems. But now let's check this out. You filled in the whole trace determinant plane with one, two, three, four, five systems. But wait a minute. I thought he said there was 13, 15 systems. That's right. 
Where do the other systems occur? They occur on the borders. What is halfway between sink, two straight line decay solutions, and spiral sink, no straight line decay solutions? Between two straight line solutions and no straight line solutions is this border where I have one straight line solution, the Omol spiral sink. And likewise, there must be on this border between two straight line solutions outgoing and no straight line solutions outgoing, this border must be one straight line solution outgoing, the Omol spiral source that's on that parabola. Notice that this right here is not a border because as soon as you say D is negative, the whole place is a saddle. Well, what about this line, the horizontal axis? That's when D is zero. What happens when D is zero? When D is zero, you have to have one of these be a zero eigenvalue. And what were those? They were the equilibrium line source and equilibrium line sink. If you had one zero eigenvalue, then you had a whole line of death. You had a whole line of equilibrium points, a whole line of not moving and solutions shooting out or shooting in from that. So here, must be the equilibrium line sources and the equilibrium line sinks. These are the border cases. What's a border between spiral sink and spiral source? It's when T equals zero. What do you get when t equals zero? When t equals zero and the determinant is positive, well, when t is zero, the t squared is bound to lose as long as the determinant is positive. And t squared loses to 4d. So I've got oscillation, but I've got neither growth nor decay. That makes sense. What's the difference between spiraling in and spiraling out? Just oscillating, just orbiting. These are the centers. This axis is not spiraling in and not spiraling out. OK, good. So now how many cases do we have? One, two, counting red. One, two, three, four, five. Counting blue. One, two, three, four, five. This gets me up to 10. There's one other case I haven't demonstrated for you. And it occurs also on this parabola in pairs. And I'm not going to disturb, I'm not going to demonstrate it yet. I want to say something else. But That'll give me one more pair, 11, 12. And then the 13th case, the mystery point. What is the transition between every possible system? It's the mystery point. You could go anywhere through the mystery point. You can go from saddle to source. You can go from saddle to spiral sink. And that'll give us our 13 cases. Uh, remember, the mystery point kind of comes in three flavors, you know, driving on the right side of the road, driving down the left side of the road, or stuck in traffic, US, UK, and La La Land. And again, I think I'm the only person who uses those terms, but I want to be visual. But first, I want to say this about the difference between the blue and the red. Let's say you were just throwing darts at this board, right? You're just taking, or if I had some gum, or if I had something sticky, which I don't have right now, I'm just taking and throwing darts at the board. Well, without looking at the board, when I throw a dart at the board, what happens? It's very unlikely that I land on one of these black lines, right? 
In other words, sink, spiral, sink, spiral, source, source, and saddle are the dominant systems. They are the majority of the systems. If I just pick four numbers at random, I'm going to land in these red regions. Now, sometimes I get unlucky, as I did right there. I could pick four numbers, and I just happen to land on one of the border lines. Remember, and I'll emphasize this here, this lower portion of the d-axis is not a border line. Now, these are the bifurcations. These are the transition cases. So if you pick four numbers at random, you've got to land on this board. And most likely, you're going to land on one of the red regions. Let's try it again. So this is what I meant on that worksheet I gave you with lots of systems. If I just pick four numbers, I know where it is immediately. I have to work out the solution, what the actual equations are. But if you give me four numbers, I know what the system is immediately. Right? Let's pick four numbers like uh, 1, 7, minus 3, 6. What's the trace? Trace is 8. What's the determinant? 7 plus 18 is 25. Now be careful. I have a feeling who's going to win, but don't prejudge, right? So trace squared is 64. 4D is 100. So 4D is the winner. So what do we got? Let's do this like you were doing calisthenics. Positive trace, positive determinant. 4D is the winner. I'm in spiral source land. This has to be a spiral source. Now remember, working out the actual equation, that's going to take work, sines, cosines, complex numbers. But I know what this is. This is a spiral source. Let's try another one. And as it is, you can throw your favorite one in the chat if you like. But if we were meeting face to face, I just have people shouting out numbers behind me. Uh, how about the 0, 4, minus 2, pi. I mean, let's get weird, because these numbers can be anything, right? So what's the trace? The trace is pi. What's the determinant? 0 minus negative 4 minus negative 8. 0 minus negative 8, determinant is 8. Now, what is that? Trace squared is pi squared. And determinant is, for determinant, is 32. So what do we got? I don't know what pi squared is, but it loses to 32. You know, pi is less than 4. So pi squared is less than 16. Pi squared loses. 4D wins. There's another spiral source. Now, do you see what our problem is? If we just keep picking four numbers at random, we're just going to land in these red regions. In fact, twice I landed in that region right there. So am I picking numbers at random? Right? It's very hard to know what random is. Do you remember? I don't know if you know the Dilbert comic, right? Where Dilbert was touring hell. And one of the demons was giving Dilbert a tour of hell. And they walked past a room where one of the sub demons was spitting out nine, 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 nine. Dilbert says, what's that? And the demon giving the tour said, well, that's our random number generator. And Dilbert said something like, well, that doesn't seem very random. And the demon said, well, it's hard to tell with random numbers. No, it wasn't random. It was a, it was a joke. But see, if I just pick out four numbers, it's going to be very hard for me to land on the border. Oh, so why don't I work backwards? 
What if someone said to you, I want an equilibrium line sink? Can you build me one? Right? You've got this company that builds two dimensional first order systems for customers. The customer comes in and says, I want an equilibrium line sink. How would you do it? You just work backwards. If you want an equilibrium line sink, then what must you have? You must have a negative trace and zero determinant. Okay. Give me a negative trace and the zero determinant, about zero and minus three. Now give me a matrix that has trace minus three and determinant zero. And you know, by the way, that there are billions of them, right? So you've got a great business model. You can just keep handing out matrices all day. So uh, how about minus four and one? Because that's certainly minus three determinant. But now I have to make the, I'm sorry, certainly minus three trace. Now I have to make the determinant zero. The determinant right now is negative four. So I have to add four. Watch your minus signs. About minus two, two. Trace minus three, determinant zero. Yes, this is an equilibrium line sink. This is an equilibrium line sink. Now, was I going to pick those four numbers at random? I don't think so. But then again, the picking random numbers is very hard to tell. But I do want you to notice something about the equilibrium line sink, whether we said that before or not. What does it take for the determinant to be zero? For the determinant to be zero, you must have two rows that are multiples of each other. That means equilibrium line sync is very easy to spot. If I see a matrix with two rows that are multiples of each other, I'm on the equilibrium line space and the trace is negative. This is an equilibrium line sync. Of course, it doesn't take much for me to write this down anyway, right? Let's work out another one. Let's say someone comes into your shop and wants an almost spiral source. They want an almost spiral source. So what are we doing? We're building matrices backwards. What does that mean? That means we have total control over all two dimensional first order systems because we can build matrices to order. So let's say almost spiral source. And what are the characteristics of an almost spiral source? It must live on the border. It must have T squared equal to 4D. Now let's not tax ourselves, but let's pick a number where T squared and pick a number for 4D is pick the same number. Okay, how about 16 and 16? That's a really easy number to pick. It's because if t squared is 16, then t is plus or minus four. But remember, I want normal spiral source, so I want t positive. Okay, I'm good with that. If 4d is 16, then d must be four. See, I'm working backwards. Now I can name a matrix with trace four and determinant four. And you could do this any way you please, except one. So first let's make a generic trace for determinant four. How about three and one? That certainly has trace four. Since we're on camera, let me write that a little bit neater. How about making this determinant four? Right now the determinant is three. So to get to determinant four, I have to add one means I have to subtract negative one. There, how about that? Is it got a trace four? Yes. Got determinant four? Yes. 
Trace squared equals 4D, yes. Trace is positive, determinant is positive, I'm on the parabola. This is an almost spiral source. But I could have accidentally chosen unwisely. I just want to mark my time because we're coming up on the first break, but we're doing very good. What if I had chosen two and two? Now this is the last pair of cases. And it's very easy to spot because it's very unique. Very unique, very rare, whichever way you want to, whichever word you want to use, right? What if I had chosen two and two for my main diagonal? Now the trace is four. Two plus two is four. Got it. But the determinant right now is also four. That means I do not want to add or subtract anything on that off diagonal. But you understand there's two ways to do that. I could put something like a one and a zero here. And this has trace four and determinant four. But I could also have filled in those last two spots with zero and zero. This is a new case. Now, first of all, so has trace four and determinant four, no question. But what is the effect of having those two zeros there? Let's check this out. Now remember, trace four, determinant four, I can work out the characteristic equation. So in both cases, what I have is repeated eigenvalue two. Repeated eigenvalue two. But in this case, when I subtract two on the main diagonal, my adjusted matrix is zero, one, zero, zero. Now that gives me eigenvector to be sure. For example, I just switch these and change the sign of the zero. Okay, so there's my eigenvector. And what about my generalized eigenvector? How can I produce zero one? Well, the generalized eigenvector, if I want to turn zero, one, zero, zero into one, zero, I can put a one down the bottom. Almost always in the generalized eigenvector case, you choose a zero in one slot, and then the other slot is determined. This is my generalized eigenvector or my almost eigenvector. Generalized eigenvector has a special meaning in linear algebra. So I have two independent solutions right here. Again, this is why I'm writing on the whiteboard because I'm gonna erase this and just write down the general solution. But then I'll show you that in this case, this plan fails. So what's my generalized solution with a one zero and the zero one? That means my solution this problem is one zero e two t plus well sorry k one one zero e two t and I gotta leave room for my constants k two t one zero plus zero one E2T. The whiteboard is great, but it's kind of small. So this is the equal, this is the almost spiral source. That's what I expected to see on this border. 
but let's try to follow that plan right here. And I fail. Watch. Right here, if I subtract two on the main diagonal, I produce this matrix. Which we could happily or euphemistically call the matrix of death. Why is this the matrix of death? It kills anything. You say, oh, I need to select an eigenvector. I'll switch the numbers and change one sign. Well, zero, zero is not a good eigenvector. I need a non-zero vector that this matrix kills. But thankfully, this matrix kills any non-zero vector. So how about one, zero? How about 10 and 30? How about negative seven and pi? This matrix kills any vector. What does that mean? Any vector is an eigenvector. Not just any multiple of one vector, but any non-zero vector you choose is an eigenvector. Now, what does that look like in the phase portrait? And remember, by the way, I'm growing. I'm going outwards, growth. So that means if I pick one, one, I'm going outwards. If I pick one minus one, I'm going outwards. If I pick two, one, I'm going outwards. If I pick one, two, I'm going outwards. If I pick one minus two or minus one, two or one, zero or zero, one. For every vector to be an eigenvector, that means I don't have too few straight line solutions. I have too many, too many straight line solutions. This is a real degenerate case, right? But I can't ignore it. It lives on the parabola because t squared is 16 and 4d is 16. So it lives on this parabola. And this we're going to give the title to sunburst source. And then over here on this side, it's going to have a twin called sunburst sink. Now I have my 12 cases, five red cases, seven border cases, and the mystery point that's 12 plus one is 13 cases. Just check the time. So let me say something and then we'll take a break. Now the first time you see the sunburst source, oh, by the way, since any vector is an eigenvector, then it has an easy general solution. I'll just take K1 times one zero, E2T, and k2 times 0, 1, e2t. Why do I pick 1, 0 and 0, 1? Because then, if you want a solution through 7 and minus 3, it's going to be very easy to find the constants. So these are very nice straight line solutions just a straight line solution, one, zero, zero, one. So it's not hard to work with this sunburst source, but it's extremely rare. In fact, what's the only way you could have a sunburst source? Look at this matrix. It's lambda times the identity Lambda not zero. So the first time you see this, and now this is gonna satisfy your problem, you say, oh my goodness, I'm messed up because if t squared equals 4d, 
I don't know which one I have. But now I just explained to you, the only way to have this one is to have a copy of the identity matrix. That means if you see these two, you can instantly tell which is which. This is almost spiral source. That's an equilibrium, uh, that's a sunburst source. So almost spiral sources are not copies of the identity. A sunburst source must be a copy of the identity. Now you have the major cases. And you say the same thing here. A sunburst sink must be a copy of the identity. That makes it easy to spot. And an almost spiral sink can't be a copy of the identity. So T squared equals 4D, not a copy of the identity. How do you spot equilibrium line source? The two rows are multiples of each other and the trace is positive. How do you spot equilibrium line sink? Two rows are multiples of each other and the trace is negative. I mean, the only case that's left here is the center. How do you spot a center? Well, complex roots with no trace equals zero, no real part, no growth or decay. Okay, now I've littered this board and we're about to take a break, but let me just say one more thing. So I just try to make these things memorable to, memorable to you. I want this to stick in your mind, right? I've littered this board too much. I've littered this board too much. You can see the handout for a nicer presentation of this. And I even like to think graphically with the icons that I made for each system. But just to glue this in your mind, if there are any Potterheads in the audience, you know that symbol right there, right? Really important symbol. I say that symbol got nothing next to that symbol. That's the most important symbol. What is this? This is the trace determinant plane. You know, the Elder Wand, the Cloak of Invisibility, the Resurrection Stone, what, what is that in, in Potterland? Together, those three made you the master of death. Well, the curves, determinant equals zero, trace equals zero, and T squared equals 4D. Together, they make you the master of any first order linear system. Okay, just a bad joke, right? So get yourself a pendant with this. I'm gonna get t-shirts printed up with this on the front and the green stuff on the back. And maybe I'll get rich selling those t-shirts. I might sell 50 of them. You know, whoever wants to take this class and then get a t-shirt. Okay, I'm not trying to be stupid on purpose, I'm trying to plant something in your head with a joke, whether or not you think it's a good joke. Okay, so let's take a break. Let's relax for a second. We'll come back, we'll do some more examples. But now you know that you control every first order system in the universe. Now let me turn my monitor around just without unplugging you guys from the session. Be patient here, oops, or without hitting you guys in the head on the paper. Let's get back to paper. Let's replace that. Okay. So this is what we've accomplished and it's significant. Let's take a break. Come back at uh, 106. And then we'll go on and show you other ways that I can use this new superpower. I'm gonna mute my microphone while I take a break and stretch my legs. You can do the same.
Okay, we're back. Sorry, it was a little bit slow there. Well, what can we do next? What can we do for an encore after that? But think about this word, classification. Anytime you classify something, it's extremely powerful. Oh, let's classify all the subatomic particles. Well, they're still doing that. Let's classify all the bromides. Uh, I, have, I have absolutely no knowledge of chemistry, but must be important, must be important to someone, right? Let's classify all the different types of eagles. Well, I'm sure someone's wrote a book and received a lot of praise and reward for that. It might be an interesting book. But classifying something is very powerful. Classifying means you own that thing, it means you know everything there is to know about it. You completely have described that thing. So when we say that we've classified all two dimensional first order linear systems, We've done a big thing. I realize I haven't done too much with you with a mystery point, but maybe I'll try to work up an example in here about the mystery point. But uh, even this alone is enough to be proud of. What are the major regions? What are the borders? But I'm going to show you some other way that we can apply that to something that's interesting to us. Okay, so when you classified all the roots of a quadratic equation, you were proud. Was that in the fifth grade, fourth grade, sixth grade? I don't know. I don't remember. But I remember feeling very, very satisfied. Oh my gosh, I know all the answers possible to this problem. That's what I, that's all I remember. So we can do lots and lots of things with this trace determinant plane. Now, this is not the whole of 3.7. 3.7 presents this plane to you, but then presents ways to use the plane. So let me give you an example. how I could use that to discuss damped harmonic oscillators. And now I will come back to the paper, maybe because I like the board and I don't want to erase it, or maybe because we'll go back to the board if I want to point at something. But let's look at a damped harmonic oscillator. And uh, you know what these look like. And I'm gonna use the prime notation for derivative. I'm not gonna write d squared y dt squared. That takes way too much time. Mass times acceleration plus damping coefficient times velocity plus spring constant times position. They all zero out because these all three represent forces. And if there's no external force to the system, the sum of those forces has to always be zero all the time. Now, we made a special point of the M, B, and K always being greater than zero. Now, I could fudge a little bit. If I wanted to discuss the undamped harmonic oscillator, I could let B be zero. If I didn't want to have a spring present, I could let k be zero, but then, you know, what kind of oscillation would I have? I'm not going to touch m, though. I mean, to have zero mass, what would that mean? Well, first of all, it would mean I don't have a second order problem anymore. I just have a first order problem. It's not a damped harmonic oscillator. And I know how to solve first order problem by any other means, right? So even though I might fudge and let B be zero, that's called no damping. 
theoretically could let k be zero. I'll never let m be zero. And that's why the book made this shortcut. where I divide each piece by M. And this is a legitimate equation since M is not zero. Sorry, I move up my paper. This is a legitimate equation since M is not zero. And the book, then generalized, and be very careful about this, because since MB and K are positive numbers, right here, B over M is still positive and K over M is still positive. But you can generalize from this to any second order linear equation. If you just say, well, let's not talk about mass, stamping, spring stiffness. Let's just talk about some constant times y prime plus some constant times y. The difference here is I am not assuming P and Q are positive, unless I want to talk about a damped harmonic oscillator. So P and Q positive, that's a damped harmonic oscillator, if you allow me to abbreviate. But I can let P and Q be anything under the sun because I can still solve the resulting quadratic equation, I can still get physical answers to this problem. So I want to make this note. In general, any second order problem can be represented by P and Q being any real number. Well, that would be a second order problem we call with constant coefficients. If the coefficients are not constant, we have to do something else. You say, to generalize the damped harmonic oscillator, don't you need a number in front of y prime? Well, put a number in front of there. What comes before p? L, M, N, O, P, Q. Put an O right there. Of course, O's look like zeros. <coughs> and I do not want a zero in front of here. Because if there was a zero in front of there, it wouldn't be a second order equation. So I'll just assume that if a number appears in front of the y double prime, it is not zero, which allows me to divide by it, which allows me to create any real numbers p and q. But let's focus. on the damped harmonic oscillator. So let's assume P and Q are greater than zero. And if, if you don't like to use P and Q, you can use B over M and K over M, right? It's just more writing. Now, you know what that system looks like because you've done this transformation before. The system that represents this is zero one minus Q minus P. The minus Q is attached to the Y if I bring it to the right side. The minus P is attached to the Y prime, the V if I bring it to the right side. But what is this? It's a matrix and what am I? I am the master of every two by two matrix. So trace minus P determinant plus Q Watch your minus signs. And what is this? Minus P, since P is a positive number, that's a negative number. Since Q is a positive number, that's a positive number. Where is this in 
trace the German plane. Well, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. I'll just make a small copy of the trace determinant plane. Trace negative, determinant positive. That means I'm over here in the second quadrant. Sorry, I moved my paper up. But the problem is, I don't know whether I'm on the parabola above the parabola or below the parabola? Well, that's determined by t squared and 4d. Now, t squared is p squared, 4d is 4q, but if you wanna let me bring back the b over m, k over m, so b is, B over M is P, so that's B squared over M squared. And the 4Q would be 4K over M. So whether B squared over M squared is less than, equal to, or greater than 4K over M, that tells me where I am in this quadrant. But it also tells me the kind of solutions I have. So let's look at an example. I'll put commas in here to understand I wasn't writing one symbol. I was writing less than, equal, and greater than. So let's try an example like, uh, y double prime plus four y's primes plus two y. Now, if you wanna go and write that trace determinant, that's fine, right? But you can remember the e, s, e to the st substitution. This also creates s squared plus four s plus two equals zero. That you can call legitimately the characteristic equation as well. If you translated this to a system, if you translated this second order problem to a system and used the linear algebra language, you would have just written lambda squared minus four lambda plus two equals zero. That's called the characteristic equation. It doesn't matter what letter I use. But what do I got for my S or lambda right here? Well, I got to solve this, right? So half of minus four opposite minus two squared is four, which is two past there. There's minus two plus or minus square root of two. These are two real roots. These are two real roots. So where is this one? In the trace determinant plane? It's over here. And the trace of this would be minus four. Remember, I got minus trace right here. And the determinant of this would be two. So this would be over here at minus four, two. This is a traditional sink, no oscillation at all. Okay, let's work our way back here. Let's try y double prime plus four y prime plus four y. Let's increase the spring stiffness. What happens when I increase the spring stiffness? Well, I'm not gonna do all the writing of the roots in front of you. I'm just gonna tell you what the roots are. This is two and two minus minus. So there's repeated real roots. And by the way, uh-oh, now we're in trouble. Is this an almost spiral sink? Or is this a sunburst sink? I know how to tell. 
I look at the matrix. Now the matrix, translate this into matrix land, will be 0, 1, minus 4, minus 4. I cannot miss with the minus 4s now. I mean, this one, this 4 goes over here in the first slot. This 4 goes over here in the second slot, but you can't tell the difference anyway. So what is this? Is it a copy of the identity? No. So it's not a sunburst sink. It's an almost spiral sink. What do I got for a trace? Minus four. What do I got for a determinant? Four. Let's pump up spring stiffness. Let's make it six Y equals zero. And there's a reason why I'm doing multiple examples here, which you'll see in a second. So now I need the roots to this. And you can do whatever you want to do, quadratic formula, whatever. You're going to get minus 2 plus or minus root 2i. Now in the quadratic formula shortcut I showed you, you take the opposite of 4 cut in half is minus 2. You square minus 2 and you get 4, which landed you two units shy of 6. So the square root of 2 and i because you're shy of 6. i is shy. OK, what is this? This is decay and oscillation. This is a spiral sink. And so this is a trace minus 4, determinant 6. I am not drawing this to scale, or else I make these three dots line up, right? Minus 4, 6. In fact, in a second, maybe I will make the three dots line up, because that does look odd, doesn't it? that the three dots are staggered that way. So this is almost spiral sink. This is spiral sink. Now, by the way, as long as I have any damping present, the stiffer and stiffer I make the spring is gonna make it oscillation, 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 right? but always damped harmonic oscillation because I always had damping. What if instead of pumping up the spring stiffness, what if I dialed down the damper? What if I dialed down the damper really far? Remember I said, I don't let these be zero, but being zero here would be no damper. Well, that's legitimate. Sometimes you have a, mass on the end of a slinky and it's not being damped. You know, it's in a vacuum or something. What's this for my roots S1 and S2? Zero plus or minus two i, or just plus minus two i. And this is oscillation without decay. This is a center. So this is trace zero, determinant four that's over here. Again, I should make it the same height. But this is a center. Now, this is not the words people use when they talk about damped harmonic oscillator. So let me tell you these famous words, these four famous words, and you're probably already familiar with them. Let's make a super large second quadrant. Because there's always damping, right? I'm always having the trace be negative in a damped harmonic oscillator. I'm damping. But I have to choose between, this will be my really crude parabola. I'm not trying to draw a good parabola. I'm just trying to draw a rough parabola. I have to choose between sink, almost spiral sink, spiral sink, and center. But the mechanical words people use for this are what? What do you say when there's no damping? 
we call this undamped. What do you say when you introduce a little damping so that the system oscillates, but does decay eventually to zero? You didn't introduce much damping. You're allowing the system to oscillate. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. But the word people use for this is underdamped. What happens if you go totally over the edge and put a powerful damping on that system? You are determined not to allow oscillation. You've done too much damping. This is called overdamped. And then here we are at the border case. If we're not underdamped and we're not overdamped, you know, like Goldilocks and three bears, we must be just right damped. But in mechanical circumstances, even in electrical circumstances, we have this famous word, critically damped. I don't know if it's one L or two Ls. So in math, we say center, spiral sink, almost spiral sink, sink. But in a mechanical vibration problem, here's our classical damped harmonic oscillator. fixed positions. In our classical damped harmonic oscillator, we either say it's undamped if there's no B, underdamped if the B is relatively weak, overdamped if the B is so strong that it dominates the spring, or critically damped if its balance is just right. And what do we mean by the balance is just right? Well, here, let's think about an analogy of you driving over a speed bump in your car. There's a speed bump, here comes your car. And I can draw really awesome math pictures, but I can't draw cars, <laughs> that looks like a dog. <laughs> I can't draw cars very well. I need to take drawing lessons, but I love drawing math pictures. Let's do the four cases. What would happen if you were undamped? You drive over, if, there's, if you had no shock absorbers on your car whatsoever, you drive over the speed bump and your car would go up and down like that for the rest of eternity no damping, you just bounce up and down in your car forever. That's undamped. What's underdamped? Well, you got some shock absorbers going on and eventually your car stops wiggling up and down, but it takes a while. That probably looks something like this. We're always oscillating through eternity, but the oscillations become so small you don't notice them. That's underdamped. You allowed oscillation. What's overdamped look like if you drive your car over the speed bump? You drive your car over the speed bump, and whomp, your car jumps up in the air, and very, very slowly over time, it comes down to equilibrium. Uh, this is just a kind of a qualitative drawing. I'm not trying to draw specifically, but I'm saying, what about undamped? You never return to equilibrium. What about underdamped? You return to equilibrium, but after a long time of wiggling, what about overdamped? Well, you don't return to equilibrium for a very long time. But there's some damping. 
So you're going to return to equilibrium. What's critically dimmed? I guess it deserves another color. Critically damped is not oscillating, but it is returning. All these things are returning. So critically damped, your car looks like this. You go over the speed bump, you go womp, womp, and you settle back to horizontal. Not like Underdamped, where you're always oscillating, even if it's tiny. Critically damped is probably the way you want your shock absorbers tuned. Now, I'm going to tease you, and I am not much for cars. I don't know too much about cars, but I did have a friend who was a race car driver, you know, stock car driver. And actually, I'll let you go home and work this out. Maybe you got a friend, maybe you got a book, but if you're driving your car, actually, you don't want critically damped. You want a little bit off of critically damped. The question is why and which side do you want to be on? Do you want your shock absorbers tuned so that they're slightly overdamped? Or do you want your shock absorbers tuned so that they're slightly underdamped? Maybe you got a friend who's a mechanic. I got a brother who is very, very good at mechanics. So go find out and report it back to me. I mean, it's not an assignment, but you know, so shoot me an email if you know which answer is correct. You actually do not tune the shock absorbers on your car to critically damped. Now, again, when I say a very blank, blank, broad statement like that, I guess it depends on the kind of driving you're doing too. If you're a race car driver, maybe you want it this way. If you're driving your family van, maybe you want it that way. So I'm not saying I'm going to make a blanket statement for everybody, right? But which side do you want to be on? You go find out. But remember these vocabulary words. Remember this image of you driving over a speed bump. Well, now let me show you a different way to look at that. And this is the rest of what's in section 3.7. Oh, by the way, in section 3.6, which we'll nod to in a second. He just says, well, now you can solve all these problems because you solved every first order linear system. So I'll come back to this in a second for 3.6. But I want to say one more thing about damped harmonic oscillators. So let's say that I'm in my trace determinant plane. And here's my magic t squared equals 4d. Again, that's not a very good drawing. These are the deathly hallows of first order systems. Uh, remember, this is the d axis. But notice the d-axis is where t is 0. This is the trace axis. Do not mix those up. The trace axis is when d is 0. I just like to think of these three curves as the deathly hallows of differential equations. But we're over here in damped harmonic oscillator land. If I allow you to touch this axis, then you're in undamped harmonic oscillator land. So, you know, maybe I'll allow you to touch this rail right here. But what happens if I presented you an equation like this? And I've got a recommended problem that looks a little bit like this. I'm trying to draw your attention to it. Let's say I fix the damping at four, but I do what? Let the stiffness of the spring be modified. 
that the stiffness of the spring be a parameter. How does that show up on the trace determinant plane? Well, what do we got? Trace is minus four. Remember, minus trace. Determinant is k. So on the trace determinant plane, where is trace minus four? This is the trace axis. This is trace equals zero. Trace equals minus four is right here. So as I allow k to vary, I'm on this line. Now let's not do k equals zero. Let's say that I have a spring in the system. But you could ask yourself what happens if I have no spring, go ahead. But let's say I avoid k equals zero. This is the line that contains all the points minus 4k. Minus 4k. Minus 4k. And do you see what happens as you increase the k? As we increase k from zero, what happens? I'm heading north on this line. I will start out with k small. What does it mean if k is small? Damper dominates. k small, damper dominates. This is way, way, way over damp. Or if you like, you can call it a sink. Now let's meet the parabola. At some moment, I'm going to cross over to underdamped. But where do I cross over if t is 4 negative? What is t squared compared to 4d? 4d is 4k, t squared is 16. That must mean k is 4. When k is four, did I say that right? 4d is 4k, k is four. I think I said it right. That must be critically damped. And as I keep increasing the stiffness of the spring, what do I introduce? Oscillation. That's right, I introduce oscillation. When the damper dominates, I'm under I'm over damped. At some moment, I'll be just perfectly balanced. It's critically damped. And as I increase, the spring is stronger. The spring dominates the damper, and I get under damped. Would you like to try it the other way? What happens if I have a damped harmonic oscillator and I tune the damper? In both these cases, I'm saying m is one, I guess. And let's fix the spring at a number like, it doesn't matter what number, I'll take four again. But what happens here? The trace is what? Minus b, remember b is a positive number. The determinant is four. The 4d is 16. The trace squared is b squared. Where is minus b and four? Well, d axis is right here, this is the d axis. And so four units high would be at this height. That's the problem is I've like over littered this drawing. So let me draw another one so I don't make this too confusing because it's too complicated. Here's another quick trace determinant plane, but here, I'm starting the B out at zero. Now that's no damping, that's not unusual. And as I increase the damping, I have oscillation, but starting to take energy out, decay. And if I keep increasing the damping, I will clearly become overdamped sometime. So I move from undamped to underdamped to, at that moment of transition,
critically damped. And that would happen when B is four again, by the way, because I already figured out four and four is critically damped. And then over damped as I continue. So now let's look at this in terms of the matrices. In the blue case, I was setting the trace equal to negative four and I was changing the K that gives me a trace negative four and a D of K. In the red case, I was setting the D to be four because it is zero and I was changing the B trace is minus B. And look at what they did. Here's one parameter. So this matrix is a family of matrices indicated by that blue line. This matrix is a family of matrices indicated by the red line. I could study the systems by studying how this line travels through the trace determinant plane in both cases. Here, as I increase stiffness, as I increase stiffness, I eventually have too little damping. Here, as I increase damping, I eventually have over damping, okay? Now I want to do one more problem. I'm not sure how we're going to do this. Let me think about this. But you see that these are one, I should have chosen black, parameter families. Of first order linear systems. The real challenging problems in this section is what if I varied both things at once? What if I had two parameters? This is what your homework looks like. Now, your homework's not a damped harmonic oscillator, but the challenge problems in section 3.7 involve two parameter families. of first order systems. And I think this is important enough that I have to give you an example. So I'm gonna pick one out of the book. You're gonna do one for homework in section three, seven. Uh, let me just take a look at what you're doing. So I know which one you're doing. You're doing 3710 alt. So let's pick something maybe a little bit like that. What happens? 10, 9, 8. Look at 8. And I have time to sketch this out quickly. But the solution for 378 and 378 alt and 379 and 379 alt. I've got sample solutions for several of these in section 37, which tells you what, they must be really important. Let's look at the last thing we do today. Section 3.7 number eight. And what I got here is y prime. I'm not going to say dy dt anymore. At least I probably won't. A1, B1. This is not a damped harmonic oscillator because there's, unless A is zero, by the way. But here I'm letting A and B vary. So A and B 
are any real numbers. What kind of systems do I get? Well, I know the trace determinant plane, right? Trace axis, determinant axis, sloppy parabola. Sorry about that. So if I pick any A and B, I have super confidence. I think maybe even you have super confidence right now. If I named an A and B, let's say you got five seconds, $10,000 on the table, could you tell me which one it is? I think you could do it. $10,000? That's a lot of motivation. That's a lot of math problems. But do you see what I want is not you to do these one at a time? Because if you did these one at a time, how long is it going to take you to find out every kind of system that you get? It's going to take you eternity. Because there'll always be another pair, A and B. You don't have time to do these one at a time. So what should you do? In the spirit of the trace determinant plane, I should make a chart. I should make a diagram. And my diagram will tell me what I have. How am I going to do that? Let's look at trace in this problem, A plus 1. Let's look at determinant in this problem. A minus B. So where is trace equal to zero? Trace is equal to zero when A equals minus one. Now, by the way, trace equals zero. I'll draw it red on the trace determinant plane. But now I'll draw A equals minus 1 on this picture. And I'm not doing much scale here. There's A equals minus 1. It seems like I shifted that axis over. When is D equal to 0? And this is a mellow version of this problem. 9, harder. 10, a little harder. D is zero in what? A equals B. Where's A equals B? Let's make that green. Here's D equals zero, the horizontal axis. But in this picture, A equals B is this 45 degree line. This is when D equals zero. Now, by the way, logically, if this is D equals zero on this line, then one side must be D negative, the other side must be D positive. I'll let you work that out. This red line is T equals zero. So on one side of that red line must be T negative, the other side must be T positive. But remember the deathly hallows. Can I take this parabola over here? Now, T squared would be a plus one squared. And 4D would be four times A minus B. So can I work this out to figure out what the parabola looks like when it goes over here? Well, that's A squared plus 2A plus one. This is arithmetic. 4A, well, algebra, arithmetic, 4B. What do I got right here? A squared minus 2A plus 1 equals 4B. Now, you, this is a parabola, isn't it? B equals parabola made out of A. I mean, just because the letters are different than Y and X, you know that this is a parabola. In fact, it's A minus 1 squared. That's just a break times 1 quarter. That's 4B. Oh, sorry, that's my B. Now, what is A minus one squared? It's a parabola that's been shifted one unit 
to the right. Oh, okay. I got a minus sign here I lost, a minus sign here I lost. Okay, good. Parabola shifted one unit to the right. It starts here at one and it's upside down and the one quarter makes it wide. Do you see this point T equals zero, D equals zero? That's on the parabola, isn't it? So here, let me draw the parabola as carefully as I can. Although this is not a great parabola, I admit. This is T squared equals four D. Now I'm gonna challenge you, but the answer is posted on my website. You can look it up. Do you see how I morphed the Deathly Hallows of first order systems? And not even morphed them badly. I mean, the red line just went over one, the green line got tilted, the parabola got tossed upside down. But now do you see I have these regions? Can I transfer my knowledge of each region here to each region here? I'll let you try to do that. What does that do if I accomplish that? That means I have described every system, no matter what A and B are. That means I have exerted total control over this two parameter family of systems. That's exciting. Now I'll warn you, this is a, I would call this a medium easy problem. You can look at number nine, you can look at number 10. And they're a little bit harder. So when you morph the deadly hallows, Deathly hell is over to here. When you morph these three curves over to here, t equals zero, t squared equals four d and d equals zero. They don't always show up as straight lines in a parabola because that depends on what the matrix is doing. So don't, this was too kind. Straight line, straight line, straight line, straight line, parabola, parabola. This was too easy in that sense. You still have to name all these regions and the borders. Sometimes some of the regions get killed on their way over. So this picture looks very, very different, but that's why I want you to try the sample problems posted. Okay, this is a complete description of 3.7 and I think I'm gonna have to leave it there. It's enough for you to do your homework problems, certainly. I wanted to say a word about 3.6, and in a sense I did when I spoke about the damped harmonic oscillator. But I want to say something about second order linear problems with constant coefficients, whether or not they represent damped harmonic oscillators. <clears throat> so that's where we're gonna start next time. Okay, yeah, you have, awesome skill now once you master the trace determinant plane. So go to this sheet. What should I say? First of all, this picture should be glued in your mind. In fact, it should probably be tattooed somewhere accessible. Like, you know, the back of your hand or something. Ah, but I tattooed it in my brain. No ink, no mess, no infections and it's in my brain forever. Tattoo this in your brain. But then go to the sheet and make sure that no matter what matrix someone hands you, you can knock out trace determinant without an error, eigenvalues without an error, classification without an error, and then the general solution based on the system. Remember the answers are over here, but they're in scrambled order. So you're not tempted to peek as much. Okay, you guys have a great day. You've been patient and uh, it's not so hot outside. So go enjoy yourself outside.
and I'll talk to you later. I'm going to turn off the recording.